And yeah, I would I would second that from from you. Welcome. Uh, thank you. My name is Lee, and I'm a settler as well in this area. Um, tonight is called "Where We Have Change," where we have agency, and we've got three panelists tonight. No, we don't. I gotta fix my notes. We got two panelists tonight. Maddie is sick. Um, and we've invited the Regenerate Groove, Gray, Gray Bruce group back tonight as well. Regenerate Gray Bruce, it's their second year of the project. It's underway. The first year was uh, research-based uh, community interviews uh, to create co-create a new narrative about all our natural spaces and landscapes and the development that puts all that at risk. So Regenerate Gray Bruce is now in the second year and it's all about amplifying the visibility of this network. Uh, this network of groups like the Owen Sound Field Nuts uh, that Gord's and the Neighborhoods North that Gord's a part of, all these groups that need uh, visibility, need support, and we're all cross-pollinating. Um, and we're all regenerating. So we're now uh, promoting this new landscape and development narrative to key players in our region. So yeah, we've invited the folks at Regenerate Grey Bruce back, but Madeline came down with a possible case of uh, strep throat today. So we're going to improvise a bit with the timelines. Um, we are going to have a shorter climate forum. Uh, we've got two panelists, like I said. Um, I'm not going to go and explain all of Regenerate Grievous because we have a, a, a few of um, a few recordings that you uh, are uh, more than welcome to peruse about our progress up to date. But I can just say at a very high level that uh, Regenerate Movement, it's a, it can be a little intense. It's important to get this right, though. Uh, Regenerate Grey Bruce is trying to do a lot of things, uh, but first and foremost, they're hoping to inspire and stimulate region-wide regenerative action in response to the climate crisis through the power of changing the narrative. So not regenerate, not only regenerative ag agriculture, I know when I think of regeneration, I think of regenerative agriculture, but also regenerating in urban spaces, public spaces, uh, the backyards of our, like, like the landscapes in our backyards as well. Um, but after uh, after we have uh, Thorsten Arnold, who's the uh, Regenerate Grey Bruce spokesperson tonight, uh, we've also got a gentleman from a group called Shift Local, uh, based in Toronto, but who's very familiar with the region, having uh, spent a lot of his time here on the on the Soggy and Bruce Peninsula. Um, so Shift Local is uh, I'll let him explain it. But um, before it's I shift, shift action, isn't it, Lee? I agree. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It is Shift Action. No worries. Thank you. Shiftaction.ca. I bet you you've already Googled it. Well, probably not if you were Googling Shift Local. Um, so here's how uh, Madeline wanted to step the stage tonight, and I'll keep a couple of her notes. Um, she wanted us to, uh, well, this is what you can expect. Tonight, we're going to suggest some guidelines that'll support those present to follow a basic human impulse to nurture and promote a good connection to others. And our format is always like online and virtual. We've done this since COVID and it's usually pretty limited um, in that we're always encouraging you to type chest questions into the chat instead of asking them out loud, but we'll only be encouraging questions in the chat in the first section of the evening. In the second section of the evening, we'll be opening up the floor, like I said. So I'm gonna offer these guidelines uh, as a supportive reminders. Uh, there's just a few here. Let's remind ourselves not to interrupt one another and just allow the person who's speaking complete presence and space. Uh, let's please reflect on her habits, uh, her, her habitual ways of speaking for those who like often speak up. Perhaps today becomes aware, uh, you become aware of letting others speak more. And for those who often speak less, uh, maybe today is uh, try speaking up more at times when you otherwise might not. And a reminder that all of us are in unique situations with dogs and babies and phone calls. So you're welcome back whenever you can. And we trust that you will pick up when you're back. You'll pick up the conversation and acknowledge that you may have missed something. And finally, the old no one knows everything, but we all know something. Uh, by this, uh, Maddie means we all have more to learn. And at the same time, we all have something to teach. Uh, the one question I was going to ask her at this point, I'll ask uh, Thorsten instead. Uh, Thorsten, if you can unmute. Um, Thorsten, it's about this emerging narrative that Greater Regenerate Grey Bruce is finding, um, like the first year research project. Thorsten, um, we're hearing more and more about narratives as a bit of a buzzword, like the old narrative and the new narrative, and like the uh, emerging narrative. 
the narrative of hope. And uh, I've seen a bunch of YouTube videos about this, and I'm sort of intertwined in Regenerate Grey Bruce as well, but I kind of want to know if I'm on the right track. So let me see if I got this right. Um, with old narratives in mind, uh, the decisions get made about what and how we build typically get at us. They give us development that's like locked in development. It's not necessarily resilient to extreme weather. Um, it takes, takes risks like conversion of farmland or shoreline hardening. Um, this old narrative, it's all at the expense of landscapes and natural spaces that we need for food and for individual health and planetary health. Um, maybe the two most visible examples are like urban sprawl, uh, highway widening, uh, locked in infrastructure like that, that could be built more sustainable and more walkable and more community-based and more climate friendly in a new narrative. So is this the old narrative and the new narrative that we're talking about? And, or what is the old narrative that we're trying to change? And what is the new narrative that's emerging? A very good question. So. I, I like to use the metaphor for narrative as the ocean we're swimming in. If you ask a fish about what's water, how does how does water feel? And the fish will go like, "What water? I, I've never seen water. I don't know what water is. I don't want to talk about water um, because that's all he knows. And water is so common to the fish that." He cannot imagine anything but water, and his entire his entire life is in the water. But he has no he has no way to basically describe water. And and if you ask if you ask a frog about water, then he can tell you well. Compared to land, this is what water is like. And so narrative is really the stories we that the the collection of stories that frame why we live, how we live, and what we live about. And with re respect to landscape, I think if you ask people, why do you make lawn around your house? Every week um, that they, 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 they tend to probably answer you just because it must have must be done. Um, and the, this this imagination of totally having different landscapes around them is just so far out of their scope of imagination that they, yeah, that and and there's there's a lot of different narratives that in the end um, contribute to how we interact with our landscape. Um, one aspect is this idea of home. Um, when we ask people what is your home, a lot of people equated home with property. And for me as a German who equates home with property plus landscape plus community, uh, the, the German word for home is Heimat. Um, and it's a, it's a different, it's actually a different meaning. Heim is also home, but Heimat is more. And so, so if people if people can only build a relationship to their property and not with their landscape and their community, then it's really hard to take responsibility for your home outside of your property. So that's that, and we don't know what like it's really hard to see what people see uh, perceive as their home because it's in their heads, and that's and that's very much what narrative is about and. Uh, also, what do we do with nature? Well, one one idea of nature is that we control it uh, and subdue it to demonstrate to our neighbors that we are in control of our lives. So, if you ask, if if you ask, why do you have so many weeds in your in your garden? Then people say, you're like, yeah, my something didn't work. It's shameful. So all of these emotions is really embedded, and that's that's together what makes up our narrative. Uh, what 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 do we want to accomplish with our with our like with a farmer? What do we want to accomplish? And one farmer told me that his fellow cash croppers seem to have this vision of I crop forty thousand acres is in a lot of farmers' heads as that's the right thing to do. That's the, the and that's narrative. It's like 
it's pro it's programmed into the head and you you very often don't have awareness of your narrative i'm sure i have thousand things in my narrative about gender about whiteness about um yeah male privilege that i have no idea about um and that basically defines my action that a decent answer <laughs> yeah no that's good and and if people want to um read about what we were learning in the interviews and the emerging narrative uh where do they go yeah we have a newsletter where we basically summarized our what we learned about narrative uh maybe you can uh, post the website um, an emergent narrative is something that doesn't exist yet explicitly and nobody agrees on one narrative but you can see it popping up like like mushrooms here and there and and typical like lots of little actions that that are no longer in sync with the dominant narrative and that's something that myself as somebody who is very much driven by rationality and logic uh very much feels if my narrative is no longer in sync with my perception then i feel very uncomfortable because there's a, a, a are you when when i think people doesn't work anymore and that's how i can perceive an emerging narrative i think what what Maddie in her interviews realized is that there's tons of stories where we think outside of our property and we start to do a lot of things which are um, no longer no longer in uh, in sync with this control and that's what we call the emerging narrative. Sorry, I didn't talk about this in the early question, and that's uh, and that's kind of where we see hey this narrative is actually quite present amongst many, many people here in Great Bruce. And so our task is rather than defining a new or ne uh, narrative is we have to tickle it out. We have to bring those stories together and make them, uh, translate them from little puzzle pieces into more of a coherent picture. And I think that's that's what, what we want to do now with describing or bringing this narrative forward and it can't be us. It needs to be the community who kind of says, like, yeah, that's that's in sync with what 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 I feel. Great. And I put the link in the chat. Um, it is again, this is amazing that it's happening in Grey Bruce. I mean, there's a whole project called Regenerate America. <laughs> so to have a regenerate Grey Bruce is really hand as um it should be really uh, uh effective. I'm gonna uh, as promised, uh, in, instead of having Maddie with her um, with her sore throat, uh, we're going to play um, a video that got queued up uh, that she was trying to show and comment on anyway. It's from Kiss the Ground. And uh, Jenny, if you could uh, share your screen and get her going. Um, I'd appreciate it with my tech support. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, you can just interrupt me anytime. Uh, as soon as you hit play, uh, I'll stop talking. But... Uh, just let me know that you can hear okay. No, we can't hear any volume. You want to try that again, share with audio? Yeah, so uh, stop share. I'll stop your share. And then if you start your share again and pick a window, but pick uh, the tick box at the bottom that says um, share audio, maybe it'll work that time. I know it worked in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. We haven't rehearsed much of this. <laughs> Leah and I were planting tiny forests all day. <laughs> Can you hear that now? If we have the power to hurt yes. her, we also have the power to heal her, to regenerate her. Environmental movements often paint humans as a problem, a polluter, a pest, but this could not be further from the truth. In my language, the word for human is which means holy earth surface being. When I call myself holy, 
I honor the fact that I belong on this earth, that we as human beings are a part of nature. The earth has gifted us with life and we can be a gift in return. Across the vast expanse of the Great Plains, indigenous nations maintained grasslands for buffalo habitat by bringing gentle fire to the land. For thousands of years, following the grass burning moon, nutrient rich ash became a sacred offering to the earth. Over time, this generated topsoils up to four feet deep, creating healthy grasslands for buffalo and other herbivores. Almost every corner of this continent was nourished by the medicine of human fire. In the Southwest deserts, indigenous farmers have continuously cultivated corn and other crops for over a millennium without exhausting the soil. They place their fields at the base of small watersheds and with every monsoon rain, organic rich sediment and water flow down from the forested mountains and into the fields. By working in tandem with the forces of nature around them, they have no need for outside fertilizers or irrigation. On the rugged coasts of British Columbia, a small silver fish is foundational to the whole island ecosystem. Coastal nations purposefully enhance herring habitat by planting kelp forests and submerging tree boughs where the herring lay their row. In this manner, human hands built the base of the food web, allowing all life to thrive. Around the globe, our indigenous ancestors touched the earth in ways that sprouted beautiful Edens full of food in reciprocity with life. In the wake of Western colonization, the attempted erasure of indigenous culture has endangered the ecosystems they supported. Today, we are faced with the turbulence of global collapse. In an attempt to outsmart nature, we have outsmarted ourselves. We are nature, so destroying her is destroying one another. Denying this has come at the expense of all life on Earth. Humanity has reached a breaking point. There is a path forward, new to some, but ancient in its roots. Regenerative agriculture and stewardship has been in practice for tens of thousands of years. Through the rise and collapse of whole civilizations, native groups learned how to live harmoniously by working with the laws of nature. They honed a science of regeneration long before there was a name for it, quietly existing for millennia. By contrast, the regenerative agriculture movement is only several decades old, yet is gaining incredible momentum and popularity. In its short lifetime, it has gained access to power, wealth, and networks. This movement, a product of Western advancement and scientific discovery, focuses on restoring soil health. But by focusing only on specific practices, such as cover crops, integration of animals, and a no-till approach, we fall short of regeneration's true transformative potential. For regeneration to be truly holistic, it must be about tending to whole ecosystems and whole communities. We have the opportunity to combine the access of the regenerative agriculture movement, the holistic science of indigenous stewardship and the power of marginalized communities. By doing so, we can heal entire biomes instead of just small parcels. We can restore access, land, and leadership to those it has been taken from. We can proactively begin to heal the history of oppression and forge a society rooted in justice and reciprocity. The root of regeneration isn't in the soil. It's within us. It's in our hearts. It's a way of seeing the world. If we embrace the possibilities of regeneration, all of our actions will connect to and create abundance for the natural world around us and for one another. 
if we expand this mindset beyond just land and apply it to all aspects of life, what else is possible? Good. Thanks, Jenny, for sharing. And that is a video from uh, a new video from Kiss the Ground, which is uh, uh, led by American uh, agricultural community and progressive farmers. And uh, uh, they've been coming out with some some great stuff. Maddie wanted to, um, and it, I think it frames regeneration quite well. Um, Maddie wanted to point out, and I'll end with this, that um, of course, uh, um, uh, regenerate Grey Bruce um, in its uh, in its second year now. Um, they of course have ways that you can get involved. Um, the ways that you can get involved fall into kind of three categories. Number one, you plant. Uh, number two, you share. And number three, you in invite along to join. Um, so planting can be uh, uh, planting native plants. Uh, you can be part of a native plant supply chain, like. It's wonderful to plant native plants, but if you can't find them at the nursery, we got bigger problems. So uh, addressing that barrier or that gap. Also addressing barriers that people face in general, regenerating their landscapes, like my neighbors or your neighbors or or uh, those conversations um, and bringing together nursery owners and farmers and seed collectors. And in the sharing, it's like publishing and highlighting your stories and the emerging narrative that we talked about and in the inviting, uh, to get directly involved either with us or it doesn't have to be with us. It could be with all the other regenerators around like uh, Neighborwoods North, um, Gray Master Gardeners. It's a wonderful collection of people that are, and even we were, <laughs> Thorson and I are at a school today. The school's talking about, talking in the right language um, uh, in Wyerton, the Wyerton School. Um, and anyway, those are ways to join and just get stuff done. Um, there are people on the ground. You don't, you don't have to start something new. We just have to find everybody that's doing this. So I wanted to put those plugs in and you can start it all at regenerategraybruce.ca. Um, so uh, thanks for um, <laughs> thanks for improvising with us and uh, poor Maddie. Uh, hope we've done her justice. And um, I wanted to pass it to you, Wacom, who's going to actually um, now uh, give a very quick bio on Thorsten so he can have his talk about agency. Sorry. Turning that microphone on is a big deal. Um, anyway, Thorsten and I have known each other for quite a long time. We are both um, from Germany. And when Thorsten talks about uh, language and attitudes, um, like friends about home, homeland, uh, it, 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 it quite uh, resonates with me. And Thorsten is very passionate about regeneration. I think he spoke about, you spoke about regener regeneration before anybody else around here spoke about it. Um, sometimes uh, you are uh, outspoken in a way that people have struggled kind of following you. And you're also very passionate about it, and uh, not everybody um, uh, uh, shares this passion at the time. Um, but as we have heard already from you today, um, there's a lot of thought in it. Uh, there's a lot of theory behind it. Uh, you're also a scientist, um, uh, so you, you speak your mind from a scientific perspective. Um, so I, I always appreciate very much your point of views and the way you, you you try to change change the world here in Great Bruce. Okay, up back to you. Over to you, Thorsten. I think that was your intro. Um, Supposedly, yeah. I think he's frozen. <laughs> oh. So we'll. Maybe I was too critical. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, how do you feel about maybe logging, uh, going up a little bit early, and uh, we'll see if we can get Thorson to exit and come back. Does that sound good with you? Yeah, I can. I could go first, and we could go to Thorson after if that works. Sure. Yeah, do you mind? 
but yeah, no problem. And Thorson, if you uh, can hear me, uh, just uh, exit out and come back in. If you can try to maybe turn your video off and get some better uh, speed. Um, you, you lagged a bit on the, the first bit too. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a bit about Patrick and shift action. Um, actually, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, but what I, uh, his, the, his talk today is another way to create agency and to have agency in what you do in your activism. Patrick is a climate and energy program manager. He, he was with Environmental Defense. Uh, one of Canada's, um, yeah, Environmental Defense Canada. And he's been involved in uh, federal and provincial climate energy policy. Uh, he splits his time between Toronto and the Saugeen Peninsula. Shiftaction.ca, like I said, uh, he's focused on tracking and analyzing the fossil fuel and climate related investments of pension funds and building a network of pension beneficiaries. Um, so Patrick, welcome. Great, thanks for the intro, League. I'm um, just gonna share my screen here. Can everyone see my screen now? All set? Yep. Okay, yeah, thanks for that kind intro. Um, I'm coming in to you from Salvo Beach tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm gonna talk to you tonight about some um, pension plans. And I know a lot of people wouldn't really think of pension plans when they think about climate action, but we've actually found a really interesting and unique leverage points for um, systemic climate action here through Canada's largest pension plans, and I'll walk you through what that looks like and what your pension fund has to do with, with climate action. Um, so just a bit of an intro, uh, Shift Action for Pension Wealth and Planet Health, or SHIFT for short. We're a sustainable finance NGO and charitable project based in Toronto that helps the beneficiaries of Canada's largest pension plans engage their fund managers on the climate crisis. We track the fossil fuel and climate investments of Canadian pension funds, and we mobilize beneficiaries to demand that the retirement savings are invested in a safe climate future. So we're asking for improved climate risk disclosure and management and for pension funds to shift their assets away from risky fossil fuels and into climate solutions. We're a four person team. We run comprehensive campaigns. Um, so we, do, we monitor pension investments. We do research and analysis. We organize beneficiaries. We do a lot of public comms and media work digital campaigning, and uh, some government relations and policy work as well. Um, I, I think this, this crew already is aware of this, but I just wanted to kind of start off by saying we are in an emergency. Uh, we waited too long to reduce emissions. I wish that we had been on this um, easier slopes pathway to net zero, but we're not. And now we're here and we have to extremely urgently and rapidly reduce emissions in order to avoid catastrophe and limit global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we really are on this downward steep slope to um, achieve our climate targets. Uh, so I just wanted to keep, everyone to keep that in mind, um, how critical this is that we have a, a narrow window to avoid catastrophe here. And we need to see uh, massive emissions reductions in just the next seven years. So we're cutting it in half if we're gonna keep the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. Um, and of course, um, this is coming close to home. We're seeing increasing amounts of flooding, uh, wildfires, natural disasters, sea level rise, all the things that are making our lives more expensive, that are, are ruining lives and livelihoods in Canada and all over the world, that are making our air quality worse. We're seeing the climate impacts right now. They're going to get worse and they're going to get worse the longer we wait to shift our economy away from fossil fuels. Um, so, so I'll quickly talk about why climate change in particular um, matters for pension funds. And I'll, I'll go through some different buckets of climate-related financial risks that pensions and other financial institutions um, have to deal with. So um, I just want to get across the concept of fiduciary duty. So pension managers have a legal obligation, a, a duty to their members to invest in their best long-term interests, um, to act in a way that's going to protect their retirement security in the long term. And that means that they have a fiduciary duty to not just the 90-year-old that's been retired, retired for 30 years, but also the 25-year-old that's just started their career and is not going to retire for 40 or 50 years. And they can't discriminate between those two members. They have to protect the long-term interests of both of those members. And that means that they have an obligation to uh, manage and measure climate risk. Um, so that first kind of bucket of climate risk is physical risk. This is pretty obvious. Um, we're seeing the hurricanes, the wildfires, the sea level rise, the storms, the floods that are ruining uh, the infrastructure that our economy depends on. And pension funds, of course, are big asset owners. They own large chunks of the real economy. They own big chunks of real estate, utilities, toll roads, bridges, ports, 
entire global companies. So they're particularly susceptible to physical impacts of climate change and have an interest in therefore preventing climate change from getting worse. Um, there's transition risk. This is just the idea that you want to be ahead of the curve, that you don't want to be investing in the horse and buggy when the automobile is at its dawn, or you don't want to be investing in um, Blockbuster when Netflix is coming out. You don't want to, you don't want to be investing in um, digital cameras when, when iPhones are starting to come out. So we really need to see pension funds stay ahead of that curve, um, technology, technology curve, regulatory curve, and make sure that they're steering the economy in the right direction um, and not getting uh, their assets stranded by investing in a industry in decline, such as fossil fuels. Um, policy and regulatory risk, same thing. We're seeing governments in Canada all of, in all of the world that are putting in place increasingly stringent policies, laws, regulations to reduce emissions. It might be carbon pricing. It might be bans on oil and gas. It might be um, banning new uh, gas furnaces and pipelines. It might be um, bans on internal combustion engine, or it might be subsidies for new, renewable energy. So this is an example here of um, the, the tightening noose around uh, the internal combustion engine in Canada and countries all, all around the world, it will become illegal to actually sell um, new internal combustion engine cars in the near future. So again, you don't want to be caught behind this regulatory curve. This will get stronger. There is, pu there is public demands for stronger climate action. And um, that creates risks for investors like pension funds if they're invested in the wrong thing. Um, there's also legal and reputational risk. So if you think about um, the, the reputational risk of a pension fund or a company that is not taking these uh, climate risks seriously, they could lose um, they could lose market share. They could they could lose uh, the support of the, the market of their, of their members. Oil and gas companies in particular, we're seeing an onslaught of litigation against uh, oil and gas companies um, because of the damages that they've inflicted on the economy, because of the lies that they spread about what their product does to the earth and to human health. And it's uh, it's becoming increasingly possible that fossil fuels will be held liable for the damages that they've caused. And you don't want to be caught investing in a company that um, could go bankrupt. It, it certainly looked a lot like tobacco to the 90s when it became simply uninvestable uh, because of uh, the damage that they did in the, in the um, legal litigation that they, fit, that they faced. And then the last kind of bucket of risk is systemic risk. And this is just the idea, um, if we do, you know, really not get that emissions curve under control and allow climate change to spiral out of control, there is no place to invest money safely. Um, there, it, it will be impossible to enjoy retirement security for pension funds to generate returns if we start seeing two and a half, three degrees of warming. So pension funds, of course, have an interest in maintaining that 1.5 to 2 degree um, climate safe future and preventing those emissions trajectories that really allow the climate crisis to get out of control. Um, on the flip side, of course, there's opportunity here. We do need to completely rewire our society, um, replace fossil fuels with renewables, build up public transit, replace all of our furnaces with heat pumps, um, do all the things we need to do to uh, kind of get off, get our society off fossil fuels. And that, of course, creates financial opportunity for big pension funds and other investors. Um, and there's their role is to make money, and there is money to be made in this transition. Um, this is just a quick chart to get that across. Um, if we are going to achieve that 1.5 degree uh, pathway, then we're going to have this massive surge in renewables, and you're going to see demand for oil, coal, and gas tapering off, and you don't want to be stuck uh, holding on to those stranded assets. Um, so this is kind of why we focus on pension funds in the campaigning we do, because they're massive investors with global power, with real influence. They're able to shape the market. They're able to change companies. They own large parts of the real economy, um, you know, real estate and financial capital is all over the world, utilities, bridges, ports, um, entire companies. Um, you, they're, they're really big investors, and that means that they have a real say in how those companies are managed and how um, that infrastructure is transitioned. And it also means that they're big investors in fossil fuels, particularly in Canada. In some cases, some of the pension funds that we uh, campaign on actually own their own fossil fuel companies, they might own pipeline companies, they might own entire gas transmission and distribution networks in different countries. Uh, like I said, they're uniquely exposed to these climate related financial risks and they have an impact not just on the trajectory of the climate crisis, but the climate crisis has an impact on them. 
And lastly, of course, um, they're accountable to the beneficiaries. They are accountable to their members. And that's millions of Canadians who are members of pension plans. Um, and they have a fiduciary duty to, to uh, meet our retirement security, to invest in our best long interest. So we have a big organizing pool of people and Canadians that are concerned about climate change that are members of pension plans. And I don't want everyone to forget some of the moral obligation here. I, I think it's wrong personally that my pension is being invested in companies that are undermining my future. We have teachers coming to us all the time saying, why are my retirement savings being invested in an oil and gas company that is undermining my own students' futures that I teach every day? Or healthcare workers saying, why is my retirement invested in companies and infrastructure that are creating the biggest public health crisis the world's ever seen? So I don't want everyone to forget that real moral obligation that we think it's wrong that our funds are being invested in, in fossil fuels that are undermining our future. Um, these are the funds we campaign on. Uh, there's 11 of the biggest uh, public pension managers in Canada. Uh, you can see at West, we have AIMCO and BCI. Um, there's a, a sister organization in Quebec that uh, campaigns on the Quebec pension, pension plan. We have um, particularly organized campaigns on the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, on OMERS, on the Federal Public Service Pension Plan, uh, HOOP, the healthcare pension plan here in Ontario. And of course, every Canadian is a member of the Canada Pension Plan, which is over half a trillion dollars now. And together, this is about $2.1 trillion in asset center management. And that's why this is such a big lever for change, just because of how massive these pools of capital are. These are our asks. This is what we want from pension funds. So a really high level commitment to align their portfolio with the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5 degrees. Um, we wanna see short, mid-term and long-term plans and targets to get there. Uh, plan to decarbonize their portfolios by 2040. And of course, part of that is an immediate end to new investments in oil, gas, and coal, a phase out of their current investments in fossil fuels. We wanna see them actually helping the companies in their portfolio decarbonize. So that means forbidding companies from lobbying against climate action. It means requiring companies to have science-based pathways to net zero emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. We want to see companies linking their executive and staff compensation to emissions reductions. And then on the other side, we want to see massive investments in climate solutions to actually build out that fossil-free economy that we need. And uh, finally, we want to see pensions re respecting Indigenous rights. A lot of times these pension funds are crown corporations. A lot of times their operations are happening on uh, traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. And we want to see them put in place policies that respect the free, prior, and informed consents of Indigenous groups where they operate. Um, so what does SHIFT do? We do a lot of organizing, and that's why I'm so excited to talk to you folks tonight. Um, we find beneficiaries of pension plans who are concerned about the climate crisis, and when we tell them what is in their portfolio, they're often outraged, and we, we get them in various ways to speak up about what their plan's investing in. We do stuff like um, flooding pension plan AGMs with climate questions, um, organizing social media actions. We have rallies outside pension plan AGMs. We do a lot of media work. We'll organize face-to-face um, -face meetings between plan members and their pension managers. Um, all kinds of things to mobilize uh, pension plan beneficiaries to um, get their fund managers to act on the climate crisis. That's one of the core things that we do. Um, that means we do a lot of media work and we always try to censor the voices of those plan members in our media work. So op-eds, letters to the editor, open letters. We were featured on CBC's The National um, a couple of months ago in March. And this is also part of our organizing strategy. We need to build a movement here. And once we you know, get our, our work in the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star and CBC News, we often have more pension plan members coming to us excited about our work and wanting to get involved. It also means we do a lot of work with them labor unions because often the labor unions are part of the governance structure of pension plans. They appoint the board members in some cases. So we actually have a good relationship with a lot of um, teachers unions, healthcare unions, different public sector unions, because their members, of course, are beneficiaries of these pension plans. Uh, we do a lot of research and analysis. So we actually put a report out earlier this year that um, gave, gave an A to F grade of those 11 pension managers and a few international examples for comparison, um, just to show how they are managing these climate risks and how they're approaching uh, fossil fuel divestments. So we've actually mapped out all of the all of the holdings in these pension plans. We've inventoried all the fossil fuel infrastructure, all the different companies they're invested in, and um, seen how they're kind of addressing these different climate-related risks. 
And you would, you would be pretty surprised and shocked at some of the things that you find in these portfolios. Um, we've also mapped the governance and executives of these funds. Last year, we put in a report showing the deep entanglements between pension plans in the oil and gas sector. So we found a lot of overlap between the boards and executives of these pension funds and um, you know, fossil fuel companies that, of course, their business model is, is hell-bent on extracting fossil fuels and burning them. And we see this as a conflict of interest. Um, we also do some policy work. So we're working with the federal government now to put in place new laws and regulations that require the financial sector, not just pensions, but banks and insurance companies as well, to align their portfolios and their investment and asset management practices with Canada's climate commitments. We work with environmental defense and eco-justice as partners on that kind of work. Um, and we're starting to see some success, uh, some success since we started doing this a few years ago. We've actually moved some of these big asset managers to set net zero commitments. Um, six of them now have midterm and interim targets to get to that net zero commitments. Um, one fund, uh, the Quebec Pension Fund, is actually divested from fossil fuels and put a screen on new coal and oil producer investments. Um, but none yet, we haven't gone far enough, none have actually committed to a full screen on oil, gas, coal, and pipelines. And that's what we're pushing for in the short term. Um, and I know a lot of people might think instinctually that um, this is leaving money on the table, that you know, removing fossil fuels from, from a portfolio is costing money, but it's actually the opposite. There's very strong evidence that had pension funds uh, removed fossil fuels from, from their portfolio five, 10 years ago, in every single case, they would actually be better off. Their, their returns would be superior to what they've actually made had they divested with fossil fuels. So um, we try to make that financial case all the time um, that it just does not make sense to see invested in this industry. Um, so what can you do? If you go to shiftyourpension.ca right now, we have an online action tool that allows members to send a letter to their pension managers. Um, so if you are or know, you know a healthcare worker, they're probably a member of HOOP. If you, if you are or know a municipal worker in Ontario, they're probably a member of OMERS. Of course, working and retired teachers are members of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Um, we, have, we just hired someone in BC to do this kind of campaigning work out in BC. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of public pension plans out there. Uh, we have a campaign on PSP Investments, which, which is the federal public service pension plan. And of course, every Canadian outside of Quebec is a member of the Canada Pension Plan. So we have um, customized tools for each of these funds where you can send a letter to your pension managers. Um, again, go to our site, check out a report that we put out. We do a lot of analysis work. Um, I can put our social media links in there. We, we really are trying to amplify our message and find new supporters. And for, um, for Hoop Omers, Ontario teachers, and the university pension, we actually have a core organizing group where we meet monthly and plan the campaign, strategize, brainstorm together on how to move this campaign forward. So if you are a member of any of these funds, I would love to hear from you. Um, we really do try to send out the voice of beneficiaries and uh, find different tools for climate action through these pension plans. So feel free to email me at patrick at shiftsaction.ca. Um, and the first thing you can do is just send this letter. It gets you into our database so you can receive updates and opportunities for action. Um, I'll end it off on this slide. Um, I always find this pretty impactful. And, you know, we, we always talk about things we can do to reduce our personal carbon footprint. It might be in eating less meat, it might be getting an electric car, it might be, you know, trying to conserve energy at home, maybe flying less than you than you used to. But uh, the real big impact we can have is through our investments. Um, so, you know, when we say that these, uh, these pension plan pl plans are $2 trillion in assets, even if we just shift 1% of that out of fossil fuels and into renewable energy or into climate solutions, that's $20 billion that we're actually moving out of the bad into the good. So that's why we've hinged on pension funds as such a, uh, a very impactful source of climate action because they have a responsibility to handle this problem and they have the means to do it. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Happy to have a discussion and answer any questions you might have. I know that was a lot in 15 minutes to throw at you. So I'm happy to chat and feel free to reach out again at patrick at shiftaction.ca if you have any questions. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, it's so frustrating to know that even after moving some of my investments to green and fossil fuel free that I'm still propping up the fossil fuel industry yep. with CPP. Um, but that's really, uh, that's really, uh, it's mind blown for a lot of us. So thank you. Um, 
I'll encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you have questions specifically about how to take action, I, I put his, um, uh, not only is it shiftaction.ca, but I think the um, the website, if you actually just want to go straight to where you can actually do something is, like you said, it's shiftyourpension.ca. Yeah. But I think both links take you to the same, roughly the same place. Um, and uh, are there any, is there anybody uh, uh, needing any clarification on that? Um, I didn't see any questions in the chat, but I know I have questions and you walk about questions. I want to let the audience go first. Um, and welcome back, Thorst, while we wait. Welcome back, Thorst. And um, I'm going to try and get you right back in the mood after that uh, Kiss the Ground video. Um, there's a question if, uh, what is your position on the big Canadian banks? Um, and what do you suggest shifting to? Yeah, I mean, we we do a lot of um, al alliance work with um, other groups that are working on banks, and you know, Canada's big five banks: TD, CIBC, RBC, Bank of Montreal, Scotia Bank. They are some of the biggest financiers of fossil fuels in the world. RBC, in particular, is actually the largest private bank in the world for financing fossil fuels. So this is a big problem. Um, they're heavily invested in coal steel, heavily invested in oil sands. They're invested in pipelines, the expansion of this infrastructure. So there's a real problem here with um, Canadian banks financing climate disaster. And there's a no number of campaigns that are pushing back on this right now. And we've actually tried to leverage uh, the pension plans against these banks because of course, the pension plans are big shareholders in, the, in these big banks. So this year at some, some of the banks AGMs, there, was, there were shareholder resolutions about asking them to disclose scope three emissions or establish a, tra a transition plan or establish a plan to phase of their fossil fuel investments. And we've actually mobilized pension plan members to tell their funds to vote for these climate shareholder resolutions as a way to, to apply pressure on the big banks to do better on this. Um, so we, we're starting to see some movements where there are leading banks in the world that are setting targets for phasing out fossil fuel investments. But um, unfortunately, Canadian banks are some of the worst ones. and um, there's a number of campaigns that I could put in the chat later um, to um, try to address this problem of how our banks are financing fossil fuels. Thank you. One quick question is, um, I think I think there's a, it's about uh, pension investments. Are they truly green or not greenwashed? How do we know? Is there accreditation? Yeah, I mean, in some cases there are, like uh, a lot of these pension plans actually are making massive investments in renewables. In some cases, like Ontario Teachers and the Canada Pension Plan, they actually own their own renewable energy development companies. So right from financing to construction, they can actually build wind farms and utility scale solar themselves and finance it all themselves. Um, we're also seeing some pretty big investments in public transit and energy efficiency and conservation and electric vehicles and sustainable agriculture, different areas of climate action and ways to reduce um, you know, gas emissions reductions. But we are also seeing a ton of greenwash there as well. So that's one of the, one of the functions we provide is kind of assessing uh, pension plan investments and identifying if they are you know, actually reducing emissions or if they're greenwashing. And, as part of that report card that we put out this year, we actually handed out um, the Greenwashing Awards, where we we gave out a gold, silver, and bronze star to pension plans that are, you know, making us think that their investments are are greener than they actually are. So unfortunately, um, in some cases, we're we're seeing some investments in things like uh, blue and gray hydrogen, in uh, replacing coal with natural gas, in uh, carbon capture and in storage that we don't think works. So there's some there's a real gap here, I think, um, in what those transition pathways look like for certain high carbon companies. And we don't always see the pension plans doing the right thing with their financing and, and investment decisions. Lee, you're muted. Thanks. Your website has a template for a letter. Is that letter also suitable to send to uh, other institutions, uh, investment institutions? Uh, one example is Sun Life in the chat. Um, I do. Th I think Sun Life is probably a pension manager in the, for some folks. Um, if you go to our tool, we actually do have an other pension fund option in the drop down menu. So if you choose that, the email actually just goes to my email inbox, but we can help you find a contact at your pension fund to start this conversation with. 
we only have capacity to campaign on you know the big pension plans we don't we can't obviously be campaigning on every single private pension plan but um, all the time we get beneficiaries of smaller private plans that want to start doing this kind of advocacy um we just see the big pension plans as the lever for for real action on this but absolutely we can help um you kind of navigate how to start contacting your insurance company or your bank or a smaller pension plan as well okay and the last one involves a couple of acronyms that I'm not sure about. I know if you can read it. Is there an EF, ETF uh, for HVAC investment? HVAC investment. Is there an ETF for HVAC investment? I'm stumped on that one. I'm Googling, um, I'm Googling I do, ETF. <laughs> I do know the acronyms, but um, I would assume that you'd want to be investing in things like heat pumps and energy efficiency and conservation, not necessarily HVAC. Uh, but I don't know of a particular ETF that's, you know, is focused on those technologies. So uh, yeah, help you there, Jeremy. All right, thank you. And uh, Thorson has a quick question. Thorson, go go for it. So it could be a good test of your audio. Unmute, please. Yes, I will now talk into the phone and listen to myself on the <laughs> computer, just as a backup. Sorry. Um, yeah, we talked with Kindred, which is a bank that's not located here yet but they would like to move into Grey Bruce. And um, we asked them, do you have sustainable investment opportunities? And they said, yes, we do. And by promoting those, we could also use cooperative banks and pull them into our area. What do you, like, do you have some ideas about working with banks that way? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I've made an effort in my own life with my own investments and savings to get away from the big banks and I moved most of my um, investments to Alterna Savings. So actually the Ontario based credit unions are pretty good. Um, Alterna, Duca, Meridian, um, at Western's Van City, they're all actually uh, fossil free banks. So I, I would recommend if you if you can getting your, getting your own personal banking and savings out of the big five and going to those credit unions as a, as a good start. Um, and I don't think that those credit unions kind of have investment and asset management um, capabilities on the same scale as the banks, but um, you can be assured that, you know, your personal savings at least can be fossil free with those credit unions. Okay. Uh, thank you. And um, is it guaranteed that uh, ESGs don't invest in fossil fuels? Joachim wants to know. No, um, ESG is a really problematic term. For those that don't know, that's environmental, social, and governance. Um, and it can really mean anything to anybody these days. Um, governance is simply ensuring that a company uh, has a well-governed board, that they're managing risks properly. Social can mean anything from uh, labor rights to um, child labor to um, having diversity and women uh, and people of color on boards. Um, environments could, could include, you know, uh, reforestation, it could include water pollution, it, it could, include, could include air quality, so it could, could include biodiversity. So ESG has really become this kind of catch-all term for anything that could be remotely perceived to be environmentally or socially responsible, but it's it's been so watered down and politicized that it means nothing really. Um, and I don't know if folks are following what's going on in the U.S., but um, there's this whole new political attack line on woke capitalism and, um, you know, ESG. And it's, it just, it's, it's kind of a, become a political potato. And we try to kind of stay away from using that language. If, if you are looking at an ESG fund that your bank offers, for example, you have no um, certainty whatsoever that there's not a bunch of polluting companies, oil and gas, fossil fuels, pipelines in that fund. It's, it's a real problem. There's actually been a bit of a regulatory crackdown in the UK and Europe and US for banks and investors, you know, trying to make you think that their funds is environmentally responsible or putting an ESG label on it, but it, it essentially means nothing in a lot of cases. They may do something well, but they may not be doing yeah. generally, generally well. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I'll encourage you to stick around. I know Sable Beach might be calling your name, but um uh, feel free to stick around and I know at the end um, there's probably going to be a lot of um, uh, actually I know that uh, you Wacom was going to have a question as well lined up but uh, we'll go to Thorson and we'll, then we'll go to you Wacom. 
So go ahead, Thorsten. Uh, I don't have an Im immediate question. I would like to weave together the movie and then Patrick's talk here uh, with landscape gener regeneration. But if we're still at questions, then I would hold back. No. No, I think we're I think we're clear to go. And it sounds like your video is okay without your phone, but just leave your phone on the uh, on the uh, on the table there. Um, no, I know you wanted to talk about landscape, um, uh, living landscapes, and how that has agency, Thorsten, and how that gives us all agency uh, over change. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you, Aham, for introducing me. It cut off when you said that I sometimes have complicated opinions that sometimes also conflict with people's perception. I and knew I'm it. <laughs> guilty. I feel guilty here. Um, but I also feel that it is part of the role of somewhat autistic people they are the canneries in the gold mine because they have a real need for coherency between their own values and actions and the larger narrative. And so it's very often uh, autistic people who are pointing out our paradigms and our reality are growing apart. So those people who want to bear with me, <laughs> please, please forgive me. Um, in the movie, in the video that we watched, one of the sentences that really resonated with me was that we have a right to be on Earth. And um, sometimes with this planetary crisis and the population uh, overshoot, it sounds like we are forgetting this right to live that's inherent to all of us humans. But this right to live comes with a responsibility, which is to take care of Earth, because Earth gives us life because we give life to Earth. And I think that's that's the foundation of, uh, or the, the most emotional uh, part that touched me. And um, with respect to landscapes, sometimes we don't know how we impact landscapes. We purchase food from all around the world and it destroys the earth in another continent. And we don't even know about it. We just buy it in the supermarket. Um, so we're disconnected from the impacts of our food or our other actions, our mining actions, all of the, all of the things we buy or the wood that we purchase get, or even the toilet paper gets mined somewhere. And, um, so our purchasing is, is really relating us to the world, and we are not aware of that. But there's another way how we relate to the land, which is through our investments. And uh, that's even less connected to our consciousness. Uh, if we give money to financial investors and tell the financial investors, do something with it to maximize profit, we are also telling them not to consider human impacts or environmental impacts. And so all the money that we are saving somewhere is actually impacting something elsewhere on Earth. And this disconnect makes it really easy to just get the paycheck and not feel, feel any emotions to that paycheck. But the reality is that uh, every investment creates a relationship with the land somewhere. And um, so, Going backwards, the climate crisis is mostly perceived as carbon uh, dioxide emissions. Um, yet, when I studied climate change in the 90s, uh, climate change wasn't yet even proven, uh, or the, the global warming hypothesis wasn't even proven yet, and it was much less uh, apparent that it's already happening. Um, even though all the weather stations in the world showed a warming trend, and that's kind of paradox, because whenever you looked at one of those weather stations, it showed that it gets warmer. But the reality then, if, uh, if you looked into the data, what you could see is that all that weather stations were positioned at the outskirts of cities. 
And over the last 50 or 100 years, the cities grew around the weather station. And there was more concrete and less forest and less water around the weather station. So that impacts the local climate. And climate scientists had a real difficulty to find a global warming signal amongst all of these urban heat island uh, signals that were common to wherever you went. Uh, because whenever wherever weather stations were established, it was always on the outskirts of cities, and there's urban sprawl all around the world. So the IPCC was then established to say, well, we have to really focus on this global warming because that's the mystical, the mystical component of our uh, Earth system that we really have to watch out for. Everybody knew that land use changes climate. And nowadays, we more and more have forgotten about this because whenever we talk about climate change, we assume that global warming is the only relevant impact of climate, uh, of, of, of climate change. And, um, well, I invite anybody to walk through the hottest yard sale uh, in Ontario in Owen Sound, which takes place in August in the, in the middle of the town, and it is hot. And then you move from there into a forest and it is cool. So what, what that means is that there is no difference in global warming between the, the, the parks uh, or the, the trees and the hot part of the city. And so we really have created heat islands in many spaces of the world, including in rural areas, because mono, monoculture, agriculture, and bare soil is basically very similar to asphalt in cities. So we, we not only created urban heat, heat islands, but also rural heat domes. And that changes the climate on, on ma many, many levels. Uh, it creates uh, air uprising. You can sometimes see birds circling above, um, above bare ground fields, agricultural fields. And it sucks the moisture out of us. And so we can create drought without global warming, just by modifying our landscapes. Um, so I, I've been trying to do something about this for many years, and this is why I became interested in agriculture. But what we see now is that I am almost 50, and I'm still one of the youngest generation of farmers. And the reason for that is that farmland prices are in no way affordable with farming. Um, land is an investment product, and um, also through this Regenerate Grey Bruce, we've met people from other countries who are buying land in Ontario, and specifically in Grey Bruce, and have dozens of properties of farmland because if they get developed, then the, the farmland that was purchased for 200 or, or even a million can be sold for, for 10, 20 million. That's pretty good return to investment, just with a stamp of rezoning. And so land speculation is basically becoming one of the drivers of, of uh, several unsustainable land uses. Um, reason being is that Investors are not like it's, it's very seldom that individuals are buying land, but normally there's land holding corporations and investors give money to land holding corporations. And suddenly these corporations own a billion dollar worth of land in an area and they have to rent it out. And if you own whatever, a few hundred farms, you don't want to deal with hundreds of land tenants. But what you want is this one farmer who says, I rent 40,000 acres in a piece. And suddenly, because of this financialization of land, we end up with huge corporations doing monocropping in our landscape and driving this landscape-driven global uh, climate warming in our landscape. And so what, what I have learned, uh, what I'm trying to understand is who is buying this land? And to some extent, the answer is foreign investors, 
rich people, but the big the big investor is also pension funds. And so while some people are 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 really looking at ecological purchasing of food, their very own pensions are destroying ecological food systems by 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 pricing ecological farming out out of the out of the market. And so there's this real disconnect between what our shopping dollars are doing and what our investment dollars are doing. And I think for this reason, um, rethinking how we invest in pensions is a really, really big opportunity. And I would like to offer a positive spin on things because I think we need positive visions uh, that we can aspire to. If pension funds would purchase land because they, they, I mean, we all want to save retirement and we want our retirement funds to, to make money. And then instead of renting it out to this one big cash cropper who wants, 40, who wants to do 40,000 acres of, of monoculture, corn and soybean, we create a new system where an intermediary works with young aspiring farmers not as landowners, but basically as new tenants. Um, pension funds could actually become real, real leverage points for for shifting our food system to a less toxic and more biodiverse production system. And so, yeah, the. Um, we can, there's, there's a lot of topics we could talk about, about land speculation, and Ontario is particularly uh, volatile in its policies around land. In Quebec, if you own farmland, you know it's farmland. It, it's not going to change into, into development land. And even if it is, then you don't make much money on it because regulations take care of it. But in, in, in Ontario, all the financial benefit, the, the, the increase of value from a, from a farmland that's maybe worth 10,000 per acre and a development land, which is worth 100 or 200,000 per acre, goes to the, the landowner. And like Tony McQuail as an MPP, MP candidate, he was suggesting, well, what about if we create an a government arm's length agency that's the only entity that can rezone land. And so they can purchase the land as farmland, rezone it, and sell it as development land. And so this, this, this government uh, agency makes the money on the rezoning and then just gives it as taxes. And suddenly the incentive of foreign investors to buy, to put billions into Ontario's land market is really is really not there anymore, and then we wouldn't have this this massive ply, uh, artificial um, price bubble. And other countries are doing that. If you look at at uh, France, for example, or Switzerland, they really don't allow anyone to uh, buy and sell land as it was uh, as if it was a commodity, but they really know that land is something living that needs to be taken care of. And um, so they, they really regulate the market. The French people have a history, like one of the biggest reasons for the French Revolution was indeed land accumulation. And um, somebody once asked me what kind of tools exist to deal with land accumulation, and I had to scratch my head because I didn't know any other answer than the French Revolution. Um, but but until today, if you want to sell land in France, there is a committee that has to approve this purchase. And if if they don't approve it, they can simply say, no, you're not allowed to sell this land to that uh, to, uh, at that price to that person. And they can actually dictate that they will buy the uh, land at a certain value. And this, of course, like. In our Canadian narrative, land is a commodity that can be sold, modified, and extracted from. 
but um, but but that's that's our choice. Like we can change change this narrative. That's the great thing about narrative. It's all of in our head, and if we decide to change it, we can change it on an instant. There is no big big uh, science behind it. Yeah, and this is where I hoped uh, that that basically rather than feeling embarrassed or ashamed what our pensions are doing to this world, I would like to challenge everybody who pays into pension funds uh, to, to shift this around and see it as a huge opportunity to make a massive impact uh, because we are not talking we are not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. If a pension fund tests something out, they do a couple of hundred million. That's a, that's a pilot. And if a pension fund goes into something, they put billions of dollars into it. And if we could get pension funds to use their land instead of for cash cropping and monoculture, and, but instead give it to younger people who are aspiring a farming career, then we could kick ass. And so, so my hope is that this is not seen as, oh my God, you're all guilty because I know none of us has any agency over what our pension funds are doing. I rather see it as a huge opportunity to, to leverage positive change. And this is why I was so happy that Patrick joined the panel and uh, because, because I think what they are doing is really working on a massive leverage uh, angle that's much more powerful than, than all of our purchasing decisions combined. So yeah, I, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. So that's that's Thorsten offering that that pensions are, of course, uh, or are a, a massive leverage point in um, in in changing and creating agency. Um, I'm also great. I'm also happy that um, Patrick's uh, decided to stick around because there's a couple more questions in the chat. It is um, it is good to check that um, and. Uh, and I congratulate uh, Thorsten on on his discovery or on his uh, journey to find out who is owning the land and identify who who isn't owning the land um, correctly. And it's the young farmers that may be ecological farmers or maybe wanting to make a difference that are unable to access land. Um, so a question for Thorsten more about regenerate Grey Bruce and and thinking internally and internalizing all this is an uh, activism. How can we um, regenerate a lawn? Uh, Tasha is asking, how can we keep regenerating a lawn? Do, you have a, do, do we have a tool? Regenerate Grey Bruce has a tool, like a list of plants. Um, there's many, many lists online that I would just recommend you to, to Google. I can, like, I have a few lists that I can uh, later tell you, but ultimately, the point I was trying to make is that uh, like the, the idea of regenerating lawn creates by itself very little impact. What it does create, it normalizes a new narrative. And it shows other people having pollinator flowers in your lawn is okay. You can do that too. And so by that way, it, by normalizing a new narrative, it makes it easier. If, if we, we once had a had a talk about first follower and uh, the first follower principle, and if you're the first person to decide I will put pollinator flowers into my lawn, you may get a little bit of pushback, or people are just at the fence and kind of wondering what is Natasha doing there. And if you can convince a neighbor or two neighbors to do the same, suddenly you are creating a movement. And I think that's that's the most powerful thing of of this uh, lawn regreening is that it encourages others to step forward. I, I know of many people who are just a little bit ashamed; they don't want to stick their neck out. Uh, lawn is a real big issue in in our culture, and so so by breaking breaking with this uh, consensus strategically, do it pretty. Don't do it in a way to offend, but rather like put a little sign there and educate and say this, 
is because I love bees and butterflies and my, I want my children to experience birds and bees and butterflies. Uh, just the sign makes a huge difference. So rather than um, worrying too much about the, the exact plants, I would worry about the sign. Even draw it yourself because there's nothing better than a home-drawn, uh, like a, a self-drawn map because it's personal. It, it shares from yourself. Mm -hmm. And a question from Jeremy. Um, what's to be done? Uh, can we make the cost of risk to the climate explicit? Do you think a solution is to tax the land assemblers or developers so that it's too expensive to do damage to, to us all? But Maybe I can add a little bit on on that. I think uh, uh, Patrick answered pretty well the uh, you know the, the initial thought that I, I was trying to get at. Um, but it seems that pension plans must uh, are required to um, are required to take into account the risk climate risk. But it doesn't seem to me as if they have to take it into a, like the full cost. The full cost is far beyond. Uh, what what I what I suspect they they have in their uh, in their calculations, um, and 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 I guess you're right, uh, Lay. That I did go on to ask about. Well, what about what about dealing with land developers? But it may be outside of this. I realize it may be out of the scope of this discussion. Uh, so, so, Jeremy, I, I think this is a this becomes a philosophical debate uh, around changing the system or improving the system. But my personal, like if I look historically, uh, we have often managed to externalize costs far away. And this started in the colonies with slavery, where we had tremendous human suffering elsewhere. And uh, somebody else in, in Europe uh, reaped the benefits. And I think we have, with with fossil, with the age of fossil fuels, we have, for a while, uh, changed that. And so the the suffering was created around the mines and around the factories. Um, and increasingly, the costs are to our children and grandchildren and all these future generations. Mm -hmm. And is it possible to measure the cost of death? of your great-grandchild? What's the cost of death to your great-grandchild? Uh, you can either say it's a dollar or it's a billion dollar or like there's, there's no way of doing that meaningfully. And uh, it's a deep ethical problem if we start to factor in future costs and, and ec the economics don't have a clear answer there. So I believe that ultimately the inclusion of future cost burdens is impossible. We don't even know the, the cost of climate change. What's the cost that climate change induces fascism? Mm, but it does. Mm. And how do you want to put a dollar figure on that? Okay. Well, then, Over I, I mean, land, land, uh, as an example, land claims processes try to put a dollar value. Uh, reparations after the Second World War tried to put a dollar value on those things. So I, I think it's worth a try. And over to you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Thorsten. And thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. Uh, first, Thorsten, I, I uh, apologize. I, it, it was amazing that you got cut off right there because, because I, 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 I mentioned afterwards that I really appreciate your provocations and your thinking and um, uh, keeping us kind of awake or awaking us to, to those different concepts, which we usually don't think about. Um, yeah, you talk about changing narratives. Um, which is such an important thought in all these different areas that intersect uh, when we talk about colonization and so on. Um, however, I mean, we, we live in a, in a narrative of feeling safe and feeling safe is often uh, the same as, you know, I invest, I invest money and as a, as a greater return and, and that has been going on for a long time. And so it's something I don't have to worry about, and people don't have to worry about. Um, although it's 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 based on 
on um, on, on false assumptions in the long run, but it has worked for a while somewhat, right? So people feel somewhat safe. And and it's very different. It's, I mean, you say it's easy to change narratives, but it's actually not necessarily so easy as we know from our own personal lives. Um, so, so one thing I was wondering, um, so how, how are in your in your personal life actually Torsten? So 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 what are you doing on a on a day to day uh, um, level to 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 create agency in in your home in, in your homeland in in Grey Bruce? What does it look like? It's a really good question. So first. I don't have a pension plan. Um, I have land and I steward that land. That's my savings into the future. Um, today we had a tiny forest planting where my son, who is 11, participated as a worker. And because he has been, he was amazed that so many students have never planted a plant. And so he first taught students how to plant. And then he taught teachers how to teach students how to plant. And the, the students were older than him. And I think just experiencing and learning through experience is, is more and more what I believe is, is the way that we need to go. Uh, we all know knowledge we have sufficient knowledge to save the entire world 10 times um we just don't know how to put this knowledge into practice and so i think we have to give people opportunities to practice putting knowledge into action and and i think that's that's something that i've tried to over the last years with Eat Local Grey Bruce, I created a venue how eaters can put their dollars in a way that promotes biodiversity and climate resilient landscapes. They don't have to do it, but they can. And many people choose to do it and other people don't, but that's that's their choice. And I don't, I, I've, I've started to make peace that Everybody has to decolonize themselves. They have to decolonize their investments, their food habits, their way of treating other people. And it's not up to me to change other people internally. If they are spiritually not there yet, that's how it is. If our civilization crashes because people are not doing the shift, we are certainly not the first civilization that crashes, and we won't be the last one. So with the Regenerate Grey Bruce uh, project, I have um, tried to focus this on doing and not on education. I think education is great, but if we only talk about the same stories to the same people, we don't get anywhere. So people have to start doing and a lot of people are doing that i uh gord edwards was planting with me uh or with us today lee was planting and there was a sense of community and i feel a much stronger connection to those people i work with and then look back and then i'm tired and i'm like wow awesome we did that uh then if i just meet in a bar and talk with people about politics and get into heated arguments like many germans do so it's like this this shifting from talking to celebrating working together and accomplishing something. I think that's that's what my role where I see my role as a as a multiplier um as a parent also and as a yeah as an activist. Okay, Torsten, I won't argue with you. Um uh, I have actually an example that 
that that that kind of um, is, is is a good follow up from of what you just talked about. And someone on this call they heard me talk about this yesterday. Um, as as some of you may know, Hilary Coburn, she's a, a teacher in the area, and she organized a climate uh, conference for youth uh, a few months ago. And uh, so I'm still working with some of the students at uh, Keppel Sarawak School. They are grade five, six uh, students uh, in the environment club. And they have three projects. One of them is, is a sidewalk project. So students can go walk to school. So parents feel uh, that their kids are safe and don't drive them, which would reduce traffic idling cars at the school and so on. And they have a great project there. The other one is about um, cleaning up some roads. And the other one is, is composting. And yesterday they, they did uh, a, a deputation at um, George and Bluff's uh, Municipal Council. So those eight students went there and they talked about one project, the one about the, um, the composting. And it was an amazing experience so the parents came, they were all, all kind of nervous with, with, their, with, with their children about that presentation. Um, two superintendents came uh, because they're curious about this and also they want to support the students. Um, and it, it was amazing how the, uh, the council responded. They were very positive, supported the students and when we think about it, it would have been almost impossible for council to say no to those to, to those sweet boys and girls um, talking about their project with so much passion and investing so much at the PowerPoint uh, and so on. Uh, I thought this this was a great example in 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 context of your narrative, how because children see the problems very, very immediate. And there's a problem, so they, they, they quite easily kind of say, okay, there's a solution. Let's work towards a solution without major ambiguities and so on. Um, so city council um, gave them the composers that they asked for and, and, and they're very um, excited, show their excitement to the students. The students also learned about, about governance, which is, which is really great. They, they, they learned so much about how how politics works on the ground. Um, and so for me, it's very inspiring um, working with young people. Um, as uh, I mean, they are the ones who inherit this world and as they speak the truth and have a lot more power when we support them. So that was my example in, in, in that respect. Um, Actually, I'm not sure if, if other people have uh, on this call have examples too how 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 they were involved in something or engaged in something that actually shifted things maybe just a little bit. Um, we also know when we do something positive and it works, um, like such actions and projects, there's a higher chance that we continue it, continue this, and other people will continue it as well. That's why I liked about what I liked about the, the municipal council by them supporting the students. These students will continue. Uh, they will not forget this moment, and and they will continue some of those uh, of that work. So that is my example. I, I was I was going to show you a picture, but something didn't work with my computer uh, because I have pictures of those students yesterday. Um, so actually. I'm just wondering, um, go very low tech. Maybe you can see that. Can you see that? These are the students at, at, at the council. It was an amazing moment seeing those parents, parents who, who usually don't really care probably uh, necessarily about all that stuff, seeing their children uh, presenting in such a powerful way. And, and be such a result. And, and I will invite everyone to uh, share. Uh, I'll start with Patrick. How, 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 how is what you're doing give people agency? Maybe that's a bit of a softball question. 
Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot there. I, I think that a lot of people like, I think there's a lot of people with pensions that don't really care how their pension is being invested. You know, that's not really our audience. That's not our people. Um, but a lot of people are just content be like, well, I'm going to get my 60 grand a year after my 25 years of public service. And, and that's it. I don't really care what it's invested in. But we're really looking for those who are already environmentally conscious, that are climate conscious, that are active in their community, um, that do care um, and find this new way to have agency. Um, and I guess I guess I just wanted to touch on some of the things that Thorsten was saying before, because just in, in my work, like I, I found this disconnect between the people that manage these pension funds and the people that they're managing it on behalf of. Um, they seem to have forgotten um, that these are real people behind them that actually want to retire um, with a secure future. And they, they really just kind of see these investments as a number on a screen without seeing the real world impacts that they might have. And I, and I think that's part of the work we're doing is to get the pension funds themselves, the investment managers themselves, to start, to start seeing um, why it, this is important. So we always, we work, we do a lot of work with labor unions. So we say like, you know, there's, there's no jobs on a dead planet and there's no retirement security without climate security. Um, and it's not even always just with fossil fuels and climate change where this comes up. Uh, I'll give a few examples like, um, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan owns um, the water distribution and sanitation system in Chile. So what kind of world do we live in where, you know, the pensions of public school teachers in Ontario are dependent on privatizing water in a South American country in, or, in order to generate revenue? Another example is maybe you've heard of Revira, a big um, private long-term care home operator. Um, that was owned by um, the public service pension investment, or the, the federal public service pension fund. And what happened during the COVID pandemic was you saw these really high um, illness and death rates in Rivera homes because they were their revenue generating model was cutting costs and not taking care of the elderly. And you were seeing all these people dying in these homes. And it's like, what kind of world do we live in where the pensions of federal public servants are dependent on revenue from having all these old people die in, in soil in their soil diapers during COVID and the pandemic. So it really raised all these, these ethical issues that the investment managers didn't seem to be taking into consideration um, in their kind of everyday activities, their number crunching, their portfolio management. And, and I think what I kind of gained from our work is that we're kind of forcing these pension managers to like take a serious look at the broader implications of their decisions. Um, and you know, realize that there's no point in kind of having a fifty thousand dollar pension at the end of your career if you're not going to have um, a, a community, a future to retire into, kind of thing. And I, I think that's part of the work, and that's that's where I kind of um, draw a lot of my inspiration from, and that's what I hear from a lot of like the teachers and nurses and public workers that um, are big supporters of our campaign. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um... Joachim was saying that there are projects that uh, maybe get people, like their parents, get people that are out of the bubble. Is anyone uh, able to share any success stories here who wants to unmute? Go ahead now. And, and while I look for unmuters, um, Patrick, do you know how much pension how many pension plans are involved in uh, BlackRock? That's a specific question. It's the clear-cut logging firm in Northern Canada. Um, I don't have that answer um, at the top of my mind, but you probably could look through pension plan reports and see um, how much of BlackRock's funds they're exposed to, not just on logging in Northern Canada, but, you know, BlackRock's the biggest asset manager in the world. So they're definitely doing business with us, with, with BlackRock to some extent. So, um, I couldn't put a dollar figure on it off the top of my head. Oh, well, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. So I think the most fundamental um, intervention point that I heard is that um, is the uh, fiduciary duty. Like there is a, there's a, in your presentation, there's a, um, there's an emphasis on growth, and we've had a whole 90 minute uh, climate forum about growth, and about the the, the paradigm that that we're stuck in there. Um, so I encourage all the the viewers to check out our previous um, episode about growth. And in the meantime, I um, got a very quiet audience, very small audience. So I really want to thank um, Patrick. Uh, actually, and actually, I have a question to Patrick. I just see it on my 
Yeah, if I know it, Bob. Yeah, uh, Patrick, you, you said that uh, pension funds do better when they're um, away from fossil fuel. Uh, can you explain that? Like, like what is actually the link? So how I so that I can explain it to other people. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's because over the last 10 years in particular, with the exception of last year because of the war in Ukraine and what happened to energy prices because of the war in Ukraine. Um, but the fossil fuel industry is like a, a volatile commodity um, that just goes up and down through business cycles and it's facing inevitable terminal decline. Um, it, it really has no future in any kind of climate safe uh, Paris aligned emission scenario. Um, so the, there is, there, the value of these oil and gas companies is basically based on their reserves that are currently underground. And if we are to meet our emissions reduction targets, then those reserves are worthless because they have to stay underground and not be extracted and burned. Um, so that's why we kind of refer to stranded assets a lot. And just in the last 10 years, like if you were to extract, um, you know, industrials or healthcare or technology or materials out of like any kind of um, all market index of like any kind of investment or pooled funds, if you were to remove Fossil, fossil fuels from it, um, it's it's the poorest performing sector because um, it's just it's just not um, a dominant market force the way it used to be. Um, so that's actually a good example of a changing narrative, because twenty years ago it it was completely safe to invest in fossil fuels, but now yeah. things are changing, so it so it becomes volatile, and so people can't rely in the long term that they get great returns on, on fossil fuel. Um, yeah, I have to jump off the call in a second, but I'm going to put in the chat before I go um, kind of the authoritative reports on fossil fuel divestments and why um, fossil fuels have been a bad investment over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, it's from a group called IEFA, the Institute for Energy, Economics and Financial Analysis, and they're kind of the authority on um, why oil and gas is becoming a risky stranded asset and why portfolios are better off not investing in them. Okay, thank you. That's Patrick. great. There's a one question from uh, Jeremy, but I'll let Patrick go. Uh, Thanks I, everyone, it was nice to meet everyone. Really appreciate meeting Thanks. you. Have a good night. Thank you, Patrick. I, well, I don't have a, a question as much as there was a, a request for examples of of uh, people feel, uh, taking agency or having having feeling more more empowered, and um, you know, with the 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 biosphere, ha, ha, you know, is heavily in, involved, and uh, in the uh, biosphere association is in, heavily involved in the climate change project in recent uh, recent uh, year to last couple of years, and um, one of those. One of the aspects of that was the Brigham Foundation's support that sort of came up through personal contact, but they gave us money that we were able to put a total of 50 uh, electric uh, car chargers in the Bruce. And this is and 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 accommodators, you know, people with accommodations at bed and breakfast and so on, um, and and the you know, not the grocery store, but other other places. Um, put in actually went ahead and made a physical change and and for first of all for our, our team it was tremendously you know is uh, empowering to to see something actually happen physically and uh, i believe that there is a i don't have really data but i, I believe that there's a strong um uh, like a, a strong impact in terms of the people who have now have a car charger at at their you know, they're uh, where they have two or three units or a bed and breakfast, this kind of thing in the Northern Bruce. Um, and it's very, uh, it's really encouraging and does, you know, and, and this sort of came out of other actions where we're taking big, big actions to try, it was a tremendously large project, the climate change project, but, but on the side, this sort of came out sort of unexpectedly and really nice and <laughs> really and I and and also I'll just mention there is the Chichiman festival that comes up uh later in June I don't know exactly when and there will will probably be we're expecting there will probably be a a a, 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 a drive-in for electric vehicles at that time in Tobermory uh so so that 
that's evidence that that this kind of activity has ongoing impact and 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 so anyway i just uh i just you know that i thought i'd give my own personal experience there <laughs> well many many thanks i'll go to you gordon Sack, but many thanks for uh the great work that bruce peninsula biosphere association uh is doing in tandem with so many other groups it's all about collaborating and i see them everywhere mm -hmm. um gord um, has anyone seen the movie Blackberry? I have not. Not yet. <laughs> um, well, I would highly recommend it. And uh, it's uh, what it is about is the collapse, well, the, the birth and then the collapse of Blackberry. And I just wondered if we could uh, mischievously uh, compare the oil industry to Blackberry and, and really uh, compromise investment in the um, oil industry with that narrative <laughs> it's a great it's cheeky, idea it's a great cheeky i love metaphors um laura do you have a, do you have an example yeah i just wanted to mention um that um we've had some really great uh, volunteer responses uh, for bruce trail conservancy work i'm the uh, volunteer director of conservation and land steward and this um, coming, I guess in two weeks, um, we're doing a reforesting of a property that was extensively logged and used for agricultural purposes, um, actually into the 1900s. And I was uh, quite amazed by the, uh, the response, the number of volunteers. I, I, originally, I was going to have two days of planting, and I've cut that down to one day. So I think the message is sort of getting out there. But I think one of the things that people responded to is that we're um, planting only native uh, trees and shrubs that are fruit and nut bearing. And um, I think that really resonates with people that it's it sounds like it's not just about food for people, but it's food for wildlife. I think uh, that's a really, really important concept. And actually, I, I'm a little bit of a renegade probably in, in the Bruce Trail Conservancy world because I think our clients are wildlife. Um, not just people, um, but that's that's a whole other discussion. Anyways, I just wanted to let people know that. Thank you, Thorsten. Laura, just to add to that, we have also planted um, nut trees and hickories, and people ask me, so when will it make a profit? And I said, well, they start bearing nuts in 40 years. <laughs> and I think just, just, creating that story as no there's there's reasonable rational smart people who believe that this type of decisions are important uh is also creating space for other people because most people think well this doesn't make any sense because you don't make big money in the next few years and it's one of the best irrational or or I, I actually think it's a rational decision but for most people, it doesn't, they don't perceive why it is rational. And so it creates space. So thank you so much for growing fruit trees and nut trees on the Bruce Trail. <laughs> I should tell you too, last year we planted um, 200 American chestnuts, which probably a lot of you know are endangered. And at the end of the uh, second day of planting, there is agreement from all the volunteers that we were going to have a reunion in eight years because we were hoping that our trees would actually be big enough to have some some nuts on them. And that was something that made, you know, you could see people were delighted with that concept that maybe they would come back and see, you know, the trees bearing, uh, bearing fruit, so to speak. I think there's a lot of optimism out there, at least on the peninsula, from what I've seen. It's really fun working with young people at the Tiny Forest uh, today, even uh, Thurston was talking about his son, Oscar, um, and uh, it's just he's uh, got us so many good anecdotes, but uh, a common, uh, in my experience, a common um, obstacle for uh, regenerating around people's houses and homes is uh, rodents, and it's they get a lot of pushback, a lot of kick kickback from about rodents and rats. Or, or mice and uh, uh, and person was like politely ex or Oscar was politely explaining um, how that it brings uh, 
uh, how it brings large birds, uh, birds of prey, and then all of a sudden people turn to like, oh, birds of prey, such a such a lovely thing. <laughs> turn that right around a different a different angle on it, and uh, and yeah, every one of my favorite things to do is to tell the kids that uh, you know it's not a necessarily a, when you're planting these uh, patches, it's not necessarily a home for rodents, and more like a restaurant with all the fruit and nut trees. Uh, I'm conscious of the eye and the time. I want to invite. Um, I want to thank. Uh, the people that are doing a lot of work. I also want to thank um, Jenny for uh, jumping on and being uh, being a wonderful volunteer, and and, Thor and you're welcome for being a wonderful volunteer tonight too. Uh, I really appreciate that. We're going to do third Thursday next month, and then we're going to take a hiatus. So it's the last one. Um, it's on June 15th, and our guest host is Laura Wood from uh, Waste Watchers because June 2023 is uh, the phase in of producer pay. Uh, on the recycling uh, in in our region. So uh, very timely and it might even be in the news by the time we start meeting. So we've got Laura to explain exactly what's going on. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it going to lead to more garbage? What's it going to, what's going to go on? Um, and it's going to be a really interesting uh, session. So that's June 15th. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, you welcome. And thanks to our panelists, Thorsten. And uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Thank week. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Have a nice good evening. Nice to see you. Bye.